Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Korean Presbyterian Church of Pinellas Park. Uh, we are continuing our American uh, version of Bible study, The Fundamentals of the Faith by John MacArthur. And today we'll be continuing on with lesson four, the person of Jesus Christ. We're having a little techni uh, technical difficulties with the uh, with the main screen, so we'll be going into backup mode here. <clears throat> so in lesson four, uh, let's uh, discuss a review from last week, as this is the uh, B session of it. Before we do that, uh, let's go on uh, with the prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, uh, we pray that you will open up our minds, open up our hearts, Lord. Bring the scales off of our eyes, Lord, to understand better the word of God, Lord, and to apply the lesson in the Bible, which is basic instruction before leaving earth. Let us understand this. Let us take this lesson to apply it to our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So in review, we discuss the names and the titles of Jesus Christ. And some of those were Lord, meaning we are subject to him because he is the Lord of all, and we are subject to him as Lord. Jesus, and we learned last week that Jesus is the Greek word for Joshua, which means Savior, and Christ, the anointed one or the Messiah. We also talked about the I am's of Christ, and there were many of them. Gentle and humble in heart, and that was referenced in Matthew eleven twenty nine. He is also the Son of God, referenced in Matthew twenty seven forty three, and the bread of life, referenced in Matthew twenty eight twenty, and the light of the world, referenced in John eight twelve. And not of this world, referenced in John 8.23, and the door, which is referenced in John 10.9, and the good shepherd, which we referenced in John 10.11, and also the resurrection and the life. I am the resurrection and the life, John 11.25, and I am the way, the truth, and the life, John 14, verse 6. And I am the vine. I am the vine, and you are the branches. As Jesus is the root of all of our salvation, and we grow from him. And we'll be in a little pause here for a second as we regain the the monitor that we just lost for a second. Pretty much everything has broken. Down. And as you can see, we're utilizing a fire TV that we acquired from S Box, which is currently loading at this time. And it should be coming back up. And also in review, we talked about the God who became man, or the incarnation, where Jesus was born a man, but he still had godly attributes to him. That was called the incarnation when he came to earth as a man. As he existed in the form of God prior to his incarnation, as Jesus is the Alpha and Omega, as is God. Remember, Jesus 
God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit are part of the Holy Trinity, and they have been here from the beginning and will be here in the end. And at his birth, he took on humanity, which was called the becoming, and he became 100% God and 100% man. <clears throat> now, Christ never, even as a man, Christ never ceased being deity, and that's referenced in Colossians 2, verse 9, as we discussed last week. But Christ added humanity to his deity, which is referenced in Matthew 17, verses 1 through 8. And then Christ, as a God, but now as a man on earth, Christ had to set aside his godly attributes and emptied himself. So he emptied himself of his divine attributes. <clears throat> now, a lot of people wonder now, if Christ was a man, how could he be a God? But Christ had to be a man to die in man's place. But conversely, Christ had to be a God to be the perfect sacrifice. Christ was the sacrifice for all of our sins. And he had to die as a man. But he had to be a God to be sacrificed as God sent his son in order to give us that perfect sacrifice where the blood of Christ washed away our sins. And those of us who accept Christ as our Savior, realize that we have the forgiveness. We are not perfect. We are not Christ himself. We are not gods. We are men and women, but we are striving to be as godly as possible in our earthly existence. And continuing with the review, <clears throat> we talked about the deity of Christ as demonstrated through his attributes. And here were the attributes we talked about. The Christ-like attributes were sovereignty in Matthew 28, 18. The eternality of Christ, 1 John, verses, uh, 1 John 1, verses 1 through 2. And his unchanging and immutable personality, which was in Colossians uh, 2, 2b through 3. Immutable, that means unchanging, always consistent. And the fact that Jesus as a man, was perfect and was sinless. Nobody can claim that. We understand that we will always have sin, no matter what we do. Our job as Christians is to try to limit our sin, to correct the sin, to repent for the sins that we do, to constantly ask forgiveness from our Lord and Savior, and understand that to stay as well on the path that we can in our earthly lives. And Christ had the attribute of holiness, referenced in Acts 3, verses 14, 15. And Christ was, of course, the ultimate truth. And Christ also had the omnipotence and the power, the omnipotence and the power of God, because Christ is God. And then we also discuss the deity of Christ demonstrated through his titles. His titles of Emmanuel, where the angel said that he will, a child will be born and he will be called Emmanuel, Matthew 1, verse 23. And his sovereignty, his power of ruling over all, referenced in Philippians 2, verses 10 and 11. And also the fact that Christ, as God, if you remember in a lesson a few weeks ago, God said he said, I am. Jesus also in John 8, 58, made the same statement, I am, because he is. And that once again goes back to the Holy Trinity. And then there were also statements declaring the deity of Christ. Most of these were made by the apostles. Thomas's testimony we discussed in John 20, verses 28 through 29. And the sovereign king of kings that we discussed in Revelation 7, 14. Today we're going to go a little deeper into Revelation, Revelation, but we're not going to go deep in, but we're going to scratch the surface a little bit more 
and as we move on in our lesson, we'll be discussing that book uh, in more detail. And also Christ as God, which is in John 10, 31 through 33. <clears throat> Today, we're going to start with Christ who was Savior and his claims. They were the Lamb of God. Christ was known as the Lamb of God. And as it states in John, the next day, John, meaning John the Baptist, saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He is the one I was talking about when I said, A man is coming who is far greater than I. For he existed before me. Because actually Jesus existed before everyone. Uh, there are other passages where he says, I am from David. I am of the lineage of David, but I also preceded David. Isaiah 53, 7 prophesies that the Messiah, God's servant, would be led to slaughter like a lamb to pay the penalty for our sins. Jesus is also the bread of life. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. And that's from John 6.35. What does that mean? Well, it means just as bread or food must be eaten to sustain life, Jesus must be invited into our daily lives to sustain our hungry souls. I mean, we thirst every day. We hunger every day. And to do so, we, we drink liquids, we drink water, coffee, whatever. And we eat food to sustain life. Without those two things, you will die very soon. You can live about three days without water, about 30 days without food. But how long can we actually live a good Christian life without having Jesus in it? Just being or saying that you are saved does not totally answer the mail. You must have Jesus in your daily life, and he wants to be there for you. And another title is The Way, the Truth, and the Life. Jesus told Thomas, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. By uniting our lives with Jesus and becoming his followers, we therefore unite with God. Because once again, the Godhead is three in one, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So if you unite, you unite with Jesus, the Son of God, you are uniting with God. And the Holy Spirit is there as a conduit. So one of the questions when we talk about Christ who is Savior, what is the difference between admitting that Jesus is the Savior or going beyond that and claiming that Jesus is my Savior. Now you notice in both cases you're saying that Jesus is Savior. But what's the difference between saying Jesus is the Savior or Jesus is my Savior? That's something to think about. And what I came up with, now you may have came up with a different answer or a slightly similar answer. My answer to the question is, to me, it means you have accepted Jesus as your Savior. Stating Jesus is the Savior implies that you believe in Jesus, but you may not have accepted him into your heart. So by saying Jesus is the Savior, you're generalizing. By saying that Jesus is my Savior, that is showing intent of following Jesus and understanding Jesus and having a personal relationship with him. Now, is the first one wrong? No, well, it's better than denying that Jesus is the Savior. But maybe you're not quite all the way there, and you need to pray on that. You need to read the Bible. You need to go a little bit deeper, and that's why we're here. And on to lesson portion 6a, Jesus as the King who comes to rule. The exaltation of Christ. As my vision continued that night, I saw someone like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient One and was led into his presence. 
He was given authority, honor, and sovereignty over all the nations of the world, so that people of every race and nation would obey him. His rule was eternal. It will never end. His kingdom will never be destroyed. Now note, this is an Old Testament love passage. This comes from Daniel 7, 13 and 14. The book of Daniel is very interesting as it is very prophetic about the, uh, the coming of the Savior and also about the end times. Daniel's visions uh, go throughout the Bible and are actually referred to in many occasions. And you'll notice he says that someone came through the clouds of heaven. And also he's talking about the authority, the honor, and the sovereignty, which is one of the attributes we discussed earlier of Jesus. And the fact that he is eternal, another attribute, and his rule will never end. There's the omnipresence attribute. All of this is discussed in these simple two passages. And in this passage, like I said before, Daniel is referring to the second coming of the Messiah, indicating Jesus has dominion, glory, and kingdom over the world. And you'll also note that in Revelation verses 1 through 7, it also records Christ's coming with the clouds of heaven. Continuing on, the exaltation of Christ. The sun radiates God's own glory and expresses the very character of God, and he sustains everything by the mighty power of his command. When he had cleansed us from our sins, he sat down in the place of honor at the right hand of the majestic God in heaven. And that's from Hebrews 1 verse 3. And this essentially means that you have no clearer view of God than by looking at Jesus Christ. So what does this mean? Once again, Jesus Christ is God. And all, all of them are part of the Holy Trinity. So by going through Jesus Christ, you do have that clear view of God. And also it states that when Jesus had cleansed us from our sins, meaning when he died on the cross, and he ascended into heaven, he sat down in the place of honor at the right hand of God. So he went back into God, back to God after the ascension, and he is in heaven at this day. And another on the exaltation of Christ. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of honor and gave him the name above all names, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth, and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. And what this is telling us, this is from Revelation, people can voluntarily cho choose now to commit their lives to Jesus as Lord, or they will be forth forced to acknowledge him as Lord when he returns. There used to be a, an old commercial, I believe it was for oil filters, Fram oil filters, and the, uh, the auto shop guy says, well, you can pay me now, or you can pay me later, right? You can buy this $3.99 oil filter and replace it, or you can have a major engine job that could cost you thousands of dollars. Well, this is the kind of, this is kind of the same thing. You can pay now, you can make your sacrifices, follow the path of Jesus, or you can wait around until judgment comes, and then you'll acknowledge Jesus, but then he doesn't know you. You weren't there. So pay me now, pay me later. Which one is actually more pain? Give up a little bit, give up a little bit of your the things you love in the world, a little bit. You're not giving up a lot. There still are many enjoyable things you can do, but you have to make that commitment now. You don't know the hour or the day. Just like with your car, you don't know when the engine's gonna blow, but if you put the oil filter in, you change your oil, you've taken care of that. You're maintaining it. You're maintaining your life in the same fashion. And we move on to the second coming of Christ. Now here we'll actually see a little bit of uh, the book of Revelation. The second coming of Christ, 
immediately after the ascension. They also said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking at the sky? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in just the same way as you watched him go into heaven. And this is Acts. Acts 1, verses 11. So what was happening here? They were watching as Jesus ascended into heaven and they continued to watch. And the angels basically said this. Why do you stand looking at the sky? He's going to come back the same way. It's after 40 days with his disciples, Jesus did return to heaven. And like I said before, that was the ascension. And then we have the Son of Man come into his glory. And let's see what passage we cover that. But when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne and all the nations will be gathered before him. And will separate them from one another as the, as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And that's in Matthew 25, verses 21 and 32. <clears throat> now in Luke 3, 17, John the Baptist used the, the analogy of separating the wheat from the chaff. Basically, you want the sheep. You don't necessarily want the goats. You're moving the goats aside. You want the wheat because the wheat is nourishment. And you, you want to get the chaff, you use a winnowing fork to separate the chaff, and then you burn the chaff away. Burning the chaff means the fires of hell. The wheat continues to, to grow. So all the nations will be gathered before him. This is when the Son of Man returns. And once again, he's going to separate the righteous, the godly, from the ungodly. And in the second coming of Christ, his glory will be revealed. Immediately after the anguish of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will give no light, the stars will fall from the sky, and the powers of heaven will be shaken. And then at last, the sign that the Son of Man is coming will appear in the heavens, and there will be deep mourning among all the peoples of the earth. And they will see the Son of Man coming out of the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. That's Matthew 24, verses 29 and 30. So the morning, that will be the unbelievers. The unbelievers, because they realize they chose the wrong side. I recently watched a, another version of the Left Behind movies. Uh, actually, last night I watched a version of that. And you could see some of the people uh, after the, the rapture scenes occurred and, you know, people were disappearing off the streets and cars didn't have drivers and all of those things were happening. Some of the people didn't understand what was going on. and They were just kind of running around rampant. But then others had realized what occurred, you know, to them. They realized that they were actually left behind and they understood what was going on because somewhere in the back of the mind they had heard the message but had not heeded the message. This is essentially the mourning of the unbelievers. Or it could even be the uncommitted. And in the second coming of Christ, we'll see the power of Christ's second coming. Then I saw heaven open, and a white horse was standing there. Its rider was named Faithful and True, for he judges fairly and wages a righteous war. His eyes were like flames of fire, and on his head were many crowns. A name was written on him that no one understood except himself. He wore a robe dipped in blood, and his title was the Word of God. The armies of heaven dressed in the finest of pure white linen followed him on white horses. From his mouth came a sharp sword to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron rod. He will release the fierce, fierce wrath of God. The Almighty, like juice, juice flowing from a wine press. And that's Revelation 19, verses 11 through 16. So what does this mean in a nutshell? The first uh, coming of Christ brought forgiveness. The second will end the false powers false rulers, the Antichrist will be defeated.
Christ will come in judgment during the second coming. When the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels and flaming fire, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus, these will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he comes to be glorified in his saints on that day and to be marveled at among all who have believed. For our testimony to you was believed. And that's in 2 Thessalonians 1, verses 7 through 10. That's where we're talking about the judgment that Christ will give upon the people of the earth. So that essentially concludes Lesson 4b. I'd like to go on ahead with a little bit of a uh, preview of Lesson 5. And the first thing we want to talk about, kind of, this is kind of a read ahead, and I know most of you don't have the books, so I grabbed this one slide here to uh, actually give you a little bit of a preview. And Jesus Christ is the answer to all man's problems concerning salvation. Because we have salvation, but we still have questions because we're people. And we are influenced, we have external influences that do make us question things. Maybe I'm not doing something right, maybe I'm not good enough. So when we talk about that, we want to understand that Christ's work on the cross and his resurrection are the only solution to man's problems. And that is why Peter could proclaim this of Jesus Christ. And there is salvation in no one else, for there was no other name in heaven that given among men by which we must be saved. And that's in Acts 4.12. And then we talk about some of our problems that we have concerning our salvation or barriers to our salvations or obstacles that we face because every day we face obstacles, challenges, threats, threats from Satan, threats from all kinds of external influences. And that gives us guilt. We feel that we're not righteous. We're guilty because we're not living up to the lofty goals that we may have set for ourselves. And some of the one of the answers to that is because one person, Adam, disobeyed God, many became sinners. But because one person obeyed God, meaning Jesus, many will become righteous. And that's in Romans. Chapter 6, verse 19. And that means that Christians, we all still sin, and we will continue to sin. But we are no longer slaves to sin. By believing in Jesus, it's like hiring a coach who gives you a training regimen to make you stronger when you go to a gym and you hire a trainer. You know, they actually give you an exercise regimen, maybe a, a path for dieting that makes you feel better if you adhere to that. You do get stronger. You do get healthy. And by doing this, by having the same training regimen, reading the Bible, communicating with Christ, prayer, and so on, you will realize the benefits of a full life. You will look at things differently, in a different way. And another problem concerning salvation is not understanding. I mean, I've read the Bible. I've, I've actually, I've read all of the books. I've never read it straight from beginning to end, but I know that I have read everything in the Bible, probably more than once in some chapters, more than others. But there are still things that I don't get. You know, I don't totally understand the context. And of course, that's why we have pastors. That's why we have leaders. That's why we have Bible study that teaches us how to read the Bible and understand it. But we do know that the Son of God has come, and he has us understanding, so that we know the true God. And now we live in fellowship with the true God, because we live in fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ. For he is the only true God, and he is eternal life. So you don't necessarily need to understand everything. What you do need to understand is that you believe in Jesus Christ that you commit to Jesus Christ, that he is your Savior, not the Savior, but your Savior. That is the path to eternal life. 
and growth. You continue to grow by studying, by reading, by example. Because the Son of God came and gave us this understanding. And it's a very base understanding. It's all that's required. Another advanced problem is not seeking God. For the Son of Man came to save those who were lost. And that's true. Jesus comes to save all of us. Jesus wants to save us all. But you do have to seek him. You have to seek him out. He is available. He is right there. All you have to do is commit to give yourself to Jesus. And he came to save all the lost, regardless of background or your previous way of life. No matter what you have done, there is forgiveness for you. If you look at, for example, the Apostle Paul. I mean, the Apostle Paul had ordered the murder of numerous Christians. He tortured people. He, he was an evil, evil man. But he did a complete 180 on Damascus Road when Saul actually became Paul. And then he went on to become... Uh, well, one of the most notorious of all of the apostles, because he wrote about 17 books in the Bible, up to 17 books he is credited with, and he also opened churches all over the entire Mediterranean region, and he lived a fully committed life after that change, so anybody can change. And through faith, you can be forgiven and made new, so Paul. Another of man's problems is you turn away from God. Maybe you had faith. Maybe you fallen. You can meet people that say, I'm a lapsed, uh, lapsed Catholic, I'm a lapsed Baptist. You know, yeah, I used to go to church all the time, but I kind of fell away from that. There's a lot of reasons why that happens. Sometimes maybe they weren't in the right environment. Maybe something happened in the church. Uh, sometimes in church, you can actually find issues with specific people. There can be power struggles. There can be political struggles. But remember, that is people. This is the word of God. So you have to follow this. Church is a great avenue for you to be with like people, but if it's not the right place, you have to find the right place. Don't just give up on that. Nobody is better than everybody. We are all born with gifts. There are some things that I do better than other people, and there are many things that other people do better than me. And that's not a reason to turn away. Because see, once you were like sheep who wandered away, but now you have turned to your shepherd, the guardian of your souls. And if you stray, you just return to the shepherd. You can always come back. You can't go too far away that you can't return. There is no point of no return with Jesus. Forgiveness is always there. But you must repent and you must ask forgiveness and you must commit. And another man's problem is that all have become useless and feel useless. And the more you grow like this, and when we say the more you grow like this, the more you grow in the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the more productive and useful you will be in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's in 2 Peter, verse 1, uh, chapter 1, verse 8. And it means that when you grow in self-control, with patient endurance and godliness, with brotherly affection, these qualities will render you fruitful in works. And another man's problems is no good works. I haven't really done anything good. I don't feel that I've done anything that's worthy of honor. God has now revealed to us in his mysterious will regarding Christ, which is to fulfill his own good plan. And this is the plan. At the right time, he will bring everything together under the authority of Christ, everything in heaven and on earth. Ephesians 1, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 9 through 10. And this means that we are his workmanship, created in Jesus for good works. We all have special talents. We all have skills. We all have gifts that God gave us. It is our job to recognize those gifts and apply them. And we may have different gifts. We may not be great at prayer. 
you may not be one that actually is good with communicating to people directly, but you might be a great worker. You may be a great servant. All of these gifts together strengthen all of us, and we take whatever we have. Everybody brings something to the table. The word of God, the living the Christ-like life as being at a great buffet or a great potluck where everybody brings delicious food. Another of man's problems is slavery to sin. We all sin, but there are some things, and we all have a weak spot, or an Achilles heel, so to say, something that we cannot resist. And in that form of sin, we are slaves to it. But because we belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed us from the power of sin that leads to death. Romans chapter 8, verse 2. This means the life-giving spirit is the Holy Spirit. Remember the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. As the third person of the Holy Trinity, he was present at the creation of the world, and he is the power behind the rebirth of every Christian. He gives us the power we need to live the Christian life. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this, come flood this place and build the atmosphere. Another of man's problems is facing death. And what we mean in death, we mean spiritual death. But I tell you the truth. Those who listen to my message and believe in God who sent me have eternal life. They will never be condemned for their sins, for they have already passed from death into life. So now you have a spiritual rebirth, reborn, or born again. An eternal life is living forever with God begins the moment you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. As your Savior, not the Savior, but your Savior. <clears throat> Another of man's problems is you fear facing the wrath of God. And there's a verse of that. And since we have been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, he certainly will save us from God's condemnation. That's in Romans chapter 5, verse 9. <clears throat> so be assured that having begun a life with Christ, you have a reservoir of power and love you can call upon each day to make every challenge or trial. Any threats that you feel, any challenges, any setbacks, go back to the Word of God. Go back to Jesus. Go back to prayer. <clears throat> The Bible is often referred to as the Jesus book, and if you understand the Bible, you will understand that it is about Jesus. The Old Testament was the preparation for Jesus, as we've stated in several chapters here, Daniel, Isaiah, uh, many others. And we have the Gospels, which are the presentation of Christ. This is Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Then we have Acts, which is the proclamation of Christ. Acts talks about when Jesus came back and he was with the disciples for 40 days, the ascension, the power of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Trinity. And then the epistles, which is the personalization of Christ. The epistles are mostly your uh, Colossians, uh, Philippians, Thessalonians, uh, Corinthians, Romans, Hebrews, etc. And then, of course, Revelation, which talks about the second coming and the pre-domination of Christ. So in every sense, the Bible is Christ's story. So this concludes lesson four, the person of Jesus Christ. Our objectives were that we presented the person of Christ as God and as man and as Lord and Savior. We discussed the incarnation and the humanity of Jesus, the true divinity of Jesus, and Jesus' role as Savior and King. Next week, we'll, lesson five, we will start on the work of Christ. Now, this concludes our lesson for today. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, Lord. We thank you for sending your Son to forgive us for our sins. 
sacrificing himself on the cross with his blood that washed us and cleansed us. Lord, we pray uh, that you will give us safe passage through this time until we meet again, Lord. We pray that we will continue to be to follow you, Lord. We pray that we will continue to learn and to continue to grow as a man. Continue to praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.